Hello everyone, my name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and thank you so much for tuning in today. In 1980, over 42 years ago, BMW introduced a radical new model called the GS, meaning Galande Strasse, simply meaning in English, on and off road. Over the many years since then, BMW have really learned to capitalize and to follow the trend of affluent riders who want a long distance adventure travel bike for mostly on-road use, if we're being honest, with a lot of really cool high-tech features and super high levels of comfort. The average GS you see on the road today, which might be the 1250 GS, which I've owned for the past year, it costs well over $20,000 US and weighs around 550 pounds. To answer the call for smaller, lighter, simpler, more affordable, easier to ride GS models over the years, BMW has um, sometimes offered single cylinder GSs like the F650 GS. With this bike here, the G310 GS, launched in 2017 and updated for 2021, BMW is offering an affordable entry point into the GS range. Powered by a small 313cc single cylinder engine, sitting low to the ground and coming in at a pretty affordable price point, the 310GS is aimed at the other small entry level adventure bikes like the Royal Enfield Himalayan, uh, perhaps the Honda CRF 300L Rally, uh, bikes like the KTM 390 Adventure and Honda's own CB500X. But even if you're never planning to leave the pavement, this is still a really cool motorcycle with great off-road adventure inspired styling that's relatively easy to ride, practical, affordable uh, for those people who just don't care about going off-road. So here's how I'm gonna break down the review for you today. I'm gonna take you on a tour around the bike and show you all of its uh, specs and features and equipment. Then we're gonna go out on the highway, take it on a good test ride on the road. Then we're gonna take it off-road on some trails of varying difficulty and show you the pros and cons to riding the G310GS off-road. Then we're gonna come back here, talk about what I like, what I don't like, how it compares to its main competitors, and then we'll have some final thoughts. So with that, let's go for a ride. So I always like to start out by showing the seat height of the bike in the riding position. So I'm around 5'10", 5'11", around 180 centimeters, and I have a 32 inch inseam. The seat height of this bike with the standard seat is 32.9 inches. So it's not the lowest out there, but it's also not the highest. And I'll put a little chart up here uh, if you're interested in the seat height compared to its competitors. So let me jump on board and show you the riding position and the seat height. So at my height, I'm able to comfortably flat foot and I have quite a bit of, quite a bit of room here uh, to touch the ground. So it's very comfortable for me. I think if you're, you know, five foot five or under, uh, you might start to have some kind of challenge depending on your inseam. But the best way to know is just go down to the dealer and try one for yourself. Now, the riding position, you can see here is very upright and very neutral. You can see I don't have much bend in my in my knee. I have plenty of leg room and uh, it's just a tiny bit of forward lean, although not much at all. The seat is very dished out, so I really am stuck into this one position, which is probably not a great thing for long rides because you can't really move around very much, but it does make that seat uh, lower. And then the handlebars are in a good position and uh, it's very comfortable to ride this bike. The riding position is great, so. All right, so let's take you on a tour around the bike and talk about some of the specs and features at the same time. So first of all, I just wanna say, I think it's a pretty cool looking bike. I really like the styling. It's kind of angular, looks like it's kind of in motion. I, I'm a fan of it, I like it. I think it looks really, really good. So let's talk about the specs. So let's first start with the price. Uh, in the US, in the USA here, the base price is $56.95, and you have to add $200 more if you want this rally color scheme. When you see rally here, that's just a color scheme. It doesn't add any features to the bike. So just that's something you need to keep in mind. Uh, the weight of the bike is 386 pounds, or 176 kilograms fully fueled up, ready to ride. And that definitely makes it one of the lightest, if not the lightest, so-called uh, adventure bikes, right? So it's not a dual sport bike because it's really more for street use with some off-road, whereas a dual sport bike would be like focused on off-road use. All right, let's look down here and have a talk about this engine. So you're looking at a single cylinder engine, double overhead cam, four valves, 
liquid cooled. The displacement is 313 cc and it puts out about 34 horsepower and about 21 foot pounds of torque. It has a relatively low compression ratio of 10.6 to 1, so you're able to use uh, 87 octane or regular fuel. Speaking of fuel, you've got just under three gallons of fuel or about 11 liters of fuel here. So depending on your miles per gallon, which is probably going to be around 60 miles per gallon, if not more, you're looking at somewhere around, you know, 150 miles per tank, somewhere in that range, maybe more if you're riding very economically. Let's talk about a few more things with the bike. You can see the sort of the trellis frame with the detachable rear subframe, which is a nice feature in case you were to ever damage the rear part of the frame. You can replace that as a piece instead of totaling out the whole frame. Uh, the clutch is a slip assist clutch. It is cable operated with a pretty light pull here. Uh, you've got a six speed gearbox. And of course, if I come around here, you can see that it's a chain funnel drive, just as you would expect. Let's talk about the suspension for a second. So you can see it's got this really nice looking kind of gold uh, plated here, upside down front fork. You've got just over seven inches of travel on the front fork, so that's pretty good. And that's quite a bit more than the Honda CB500X I just finished testing. You've got the same 7.1 inches in the back here. You can see the monoshock. You do have a preload adjustment on the rear shock, but other than that, there's no adjustments on the suspension. And that kind of makes sense when you look at this price point. For wheels and tires, you're looking at cast wheels. As you can see, you've got a 19 inch front wheel, it's a 110 section width, and you've got a 17 inch rear wheel, it's a 150 section width rear tire there. For brakes, we're looking at a 300 millimeter single disc, so it's not a dual disc setup, it's a single disc, you, but you have a four piston radially mounted Bybray caliper. Bybray is a subsidiary of Brembo, which is a very famous braking company. So I've gone ahead and turned on the ignition so I can kind of show you around the bike. You can see it's got this lower front fender than this front beak here. You've got the LED headlight, high and low beam. You also have the LED turn signals, which is a nice touch at this price point. Coming around here, you can see the plastic side fairings. It does have a skid plate, although it's pretty thin plastic, so that's not going to protect you if you bash into a big rock. You've got your brake pedals here. Uh, the pegs have a removable rubber insert, so if you're riding off-road on slippery surfaces, you can pull this rubber out. You've got passenger pegs that flip down. This is kind of interesting how they mounted the exhaust and the passenger pegs kind of on this extension bar here. I thought that was an interesting feature. You can see the seat, it's really dished out here for the rider. And when you ride, you feel like you're kind of, you're sitting in this pocket, um, which could be good or bad depending on your perspective. Pretty decent passenger seat, good grab handles, and a decent place to strap on uh, some rear luggage there. You can see you've got a rear LED brake taillight, uh, license plate holder, which comes down pretty far, obviously. LED turn signals again, Metzler Turan's tires. I wanted to mention the tires. The rear brake is a single piston, and I, I'll put the diameter of the rotor here because I can't remember it off the top of my head. Coming around to this side of the bike, not much more to talk about. You can see the side stand there, which works as you would expect. Let's jump on board and kind of, whoa, kind of show you the uh, dashboard here and some of the controls. So you've got the typical BMW mirrors. They all kind of, all the BMWs have these same shape of mirrors and they work really well. The switch gear and the handlebars and the instruments are where you really see the difference. So this does not appear like all the other BMWs. It looks much more budget, like it's coming from uh, a different manufacturer, which it probably is. So you've got a tubular steel handlebar on the left switch gear. You've got the flash to pass. You've got the high-low beam turn signals here. They're not auto-canceling. <laughs> Horn, which is not very good, which is typical. Stop-start switch start switch there. The levers, a nice touch is you've got adjustable levers for both your clutch and your brake, which is nice. You can see stainless steel braided brake lines, which is again another nice thing for this price point. The windshield is just a very small little spoiler, doesn't really provide any meaningful wind protection. And then the dashboard, you've got, it's an LCD gauge, which is pretty legible. Uh, you've got the fuel uh, capacity there. You've got a trip meter. You can scroll through trip one, trip two, uh, range, fuel consumption, average speed, date, and then there's odometer, uh, oh, and engine temperature, which I thought was kind of nice. You've got a clock, you've got a tachometer, which goes along the bottom here, gear position indicator, and a speedometer. So actually pretty comprehensive instrumentation. The, it's a traditional key. You don't get keyless ride on a BMW at this price point, and then the fuel tank opens normally. As you would expect, you're not getting those fancy gas tank caps like the more expensive bikes. 
Okay, let's get this bike out on the road. We'll do the highway and then we'll hit some dirt. So starting up the 310 GS, uh, let's see, neutral and then, okay, there we go. It actually has a pretty decent little exhaust note. That doesn't sound bad for a small single cylinder engine. Sounds pretty throaty actually. So let's go ahead and go for a ride. Now, I meant to mention in the walk around, this bike has standard ABS brakes, and there's actually no way to disable the ABS, which I think is an interesting choice for a bike that's supposed to go off road that you can't shut off the ABS. But you have the same problem with the Honda CB500X. I missed that gear change because I don't have the gear, uh, gear lever set up for me for my boots and everything. So, what do you notice when you first start riding the 310 GS? Well, it's um, very smooth for a single cylinder, although we're not at the high RPMs yet. So I think riding around town, urban environments, it's low to the ground, it's nimble, it's, you know, changes direction easily. It feels very, very light and it feels kind of playful. Uh, the riding position is great, super comfortable and upright, plenty of leg room. Uh, the seat does lock you into one position, but I think I could live with that. I don't know about touring on it all day. You can see very well out of the mirrors. The dashboard is very legible. The controls are all easy to use. So here's the thing with this engine. If you're willing to rev the snot out of it all the way to 10,000 RPM, it actually it actually goes along pretty well. I mean, 34 horsepower is nothing to sneeze at uh, for a bike of this size. I mean, to give you an example, like I've been riding the 300cc dual sports, like the Honda and the Kawasaki. Those have around, I wanna say 25 to 27 horsepower. This is noticeably more powerful than those. And you can shoot up to 60 pretty, pretty fast on this. There were 70 miles an hour there, so it has a good amount of power. Now, would you want to cruise at 75 or 80 miles per hour or 110 kilometers per hour all day long? Probably not because, you know, above like six, 7,000 RPM, you definitely feel some vibrations from that single cylinder engine. But I think for a single, it's actually quite smooth. One thing I am noticing is the suspension is very, very soft. So there's a ton of brake dive. Uh, when you go for the brakes, you really feel that front suspension dive down. Part of that is it has quite a bit of travel at over seven inches, but also I think it has very, very soft spring rates. Now, one thing you don't have a lot of, because it's only a 313cc engine, you don't have a lot of torque. So, to give you an example of that, if I'm going about 45 miles an hour in six gear and top gear, and I open the throttle all the way, there's not much happening. I mean, it accelerates, but it, it accelerates slowly. If you want to accelerate on this bike, you have to wind it out like this. So the engine kind of sounds like an angry blender, right? Like I have like one of those Vitamix blenders. It kind of sounds like making my smoothie in the morning and that's okay. I don't think that's a terrible thing, uh, but just something you're gonna have to keep in mind and test ride it. It is the small single cylinder after all. So now let's talk about the handling. So the bike, because it has pretty skinny tires, uh, it, it handles very well. It, it's very, very nimble and agile and it's, the, you know, the lightweight really plays into that too. Um, it has a smooth ride, so it absorbs all these bumps in the road very, very well. So it's very comfortable. But also, if you ride more aggressively, you know, there's that, there's that brake dive pitching up and down there that you can probably see in the video. It's fun to ride on these canyon roads. You can use all the power, so it's very engaging. 
Um, in terms of the braking power, the braking power is, is good. It, I, it's okay, right, for this price point. It's adequate. I mean, you're probably not going to ride this bike with a passenger and a ton of luggage. This is more a bike that you're going to ride probably by yourself. Um, and it has enough brakes for that. There's another brake test, so it's okay. I would say the brakes are average. Okay, let's do some acceleration runs here. So you see how I'm out here playing around like this? This is a good demonstration of why I'm a believer in small bikes, small lightweight adventure bikes when you're learning to ride off-road. Or a dual sport bike for that matter. Now, I'm kind of out of breath. But my point is that if you want to learn off-road riding, don't get a 1250GS or even an A50GS. Get this to learn and then graduate to bigger, heavier bikes when you feel more comfortable controlling a motorcycle in an off-road environment and get that training. So this bike, because it's small, light, nimble, and playful, I'm not intimidated by it. I can take it down to these rough little tracks, even with these three tires, and I don't feel like I'm gonna get stuck when I'm by myself and be stranded. So it's a lot of fun to do this. Now let's go test it on a normal dirt road and then take it on the trail that we normally test all the bikes on. The other good thing about this is it's so low to the ground that at any point, I can just put my feet down on both sides. Now this is probably the kind of, you know, fire road that most people are going to take their 310GS on. This road is very bumpy and very kind of torn up from all the uh, truck traffic. Um, I take a lot of test bikes on here. And the first thing I notice is that, yeah, you definitely notice that it's a pretty budget suspension. I just took the Honda CB500X on this trail, the updated one the 2022 with a better suspension and it was a lot better than this so you feel like it's soft but it's also harsh at the same time now if you keep your pace within check which i think a lot of people are going to do because this is that entry level bike if you keep your pace kind of slow it's okay if you try to ride you know start riding faster that's when the limitation of sort of the bouncy suspension is gonna is gonna come into play Ow. And the springs are also very soft, so you can bottom out the suspension uh, very, very easily. I mean, I'm not super heavy. I weigh about 190 pounds, so, you know, there's going to be people heavier than me riding this. It feels like with a suspension upgrade, this bike would be very, very capable as an off-road bike. The engine's actually pretty fun and sporty. It's fun to ride. All right, let's um, try not to break this thing. We'll take it on a slightly rougher track, which I like to test all my test bikes on. These tires are very slippery, so I really have to be careful and not get hurt like I did when I was filming that Honda 300 video. So I've probably already said this before in the video and I feel like I'm being repetitive, but the thing with this bike, if you're willing to go at a gentle pace, you're going to be fine and you can kind of, you know, just kind of tractor through almost any situation because, uh, Again, it's low to the ground, it's lightweight, it's not intimidating. 
to ride and I mean I'd love to ride one of these with knobby tires and like a suspension upgrade I think it'd be really awesome now do you notice the lighter weight versus its competitors um yeah I would say that I do like it it feels a little bit lighter than the Honda CB500X I just tested and that's because it is ow it is lighter um for standing up uh for standing up, you're going to need to do some work on this. Like, the pegs seem to be in a weird position. They're also too small. And uh, the handlebars, maybe you need a riser or something, uh, if, especially if you're a taller person. But the but the seated position is, is pretty comfortable. Now, there's no way to disable the ABS, but what I'm finding here is that the ABS is still pretty responsive, even in the dirt. Um, it's not... It, it's not too intrusive to where it's a real problem. But I would like to be able to at least disable the rear ABS to be able to slide the back end. Oh, got the big ruts here. Let's get on this side. Now, some people said the fueling was jerky or kind of a jerky throttle. I don't really feel that on mine. Maybe they updated it for 21 or 22, but even in second gear, I can go down to eight miles an hour nine miles an hour and just let the bike idle like this first gear i can idle along here at five miles an hour look at that this is why this is easy to ride no throttle six miles an hour first gear it's not stalling super slow you know you could get through just about anything riding like this and any time you could just stop and put your feet down because it's fairly low to the ground for an adventure bike rocks we gotta be careful in the rocks ah, the skid plate's not gonna hold up if we hit a big rock I don't even need to film anymore I'm just riding now because I'm just having a good time all right well we got to stop playing around we got to get back to the driveway and finish this review but I'm having a fun time let's see we got the bike got some dust on the bike ground clearance is actually pretty decent on this thing I'm impressed by that Overall, I, I give it uh, two thumbs up. I enjoy it. Just keep the limitations in mind. All right, well, we're back. I hope you all enjoyed going on that ride as much as I did on this beautiful late spring day. So one of the things I love most about the G310GS, probably a lot of this is clear by now, but the number one thing I love is just how light and playful and easy to ride it is. It's not intimidating. So if you're newer to off-road, if you're learning off-road, or if you're a more experienced rider who's just sick of overweight adventure bikes, this thing is a lot of fun because it's only like 380 pounds. You can reach the ground. Well, I mean, as long as you're you know, not really too short, you can reach the ground. And um, it's engaging and fun to ride. The engine has just enough power to go highway speeds, you know, 70 miles per hour, 110 kilometers per hour. But it's not too much power that it's like scary. The suspension is... You know, it's okay, it's not great, but overall, it's just fun to ride, light, playful, agile. I really like the handling. I also really like the styling. I think it looks the part. I, I really enjoy how this bike looks. Another thing I really appreciate about the bike is the ground clearance. This has quite a bit of ground clearance, and having just come off the Honda CB500X, uh, this is quite a bit more clearance for going over off-road obstacles, and I could really see, like, with some better tires and some better protection parts, that this bike would be pretty cool, pretty fun, and capable to ride on rougher off-road trails. So what are the things I don't like about the 310 GS? One of the things that sticks out to me is there's uh, the electronics are pretty basic. Well, there are no electronics, essentially. So you have ABS, but you can't turn it off. So that means in the dirt, you can't slide it around, which if you're learning to ride off-road at like one of the adventure classes, they're gonna want you to turn that off so you can slide the bike around and learn how the loss of traction feels sliding the rear end. There's also no traction control, and I can live with that, but I think it's the ABS part that kind of bugs me. The other thing I don't like, which I sound like a broken record in all my bike reviews, but it's very softly suspended, it's very softly sprung. So if you're over 200 pounds and you're riding off-road, you're gonna bottom that rear suspension out quite a bit. I bottomed it out a lot. Uh, it's not the worst bike in the world in that regard, but it's, it's definitely very soft and I know there are suspension upgrades available. So let's talk about the competition for the 310GS. I think there's really five main competitors that this bike has. If you look in that lightweight adventure segment and not so much at the dual sport segment, which is kind of its own thing. You've got the Kawasaki Versus X300. You've got the Honda CB500X, the Royal Enfield Himalayan. 
you've got KTM's 390 Adventure, and you have Honda's CRF 300L Rally version. So as I talk through some of these competitors, I'm gonna put some charts up here on the screen because I've pulled the data for these uh, six bikes in this category to show you how they compare in terms of various uh, specifications and features. Let's first talk about the KTM 390 Adventure. I feel like the 390 Adventure is probably the leader in this category if you want the maximum overall capability in this price point in this engine size range. It has quite a bit of horsepower. It has really good electronics with traction control, uh, which is adjustable and ABS that you can disable. Uh, so it has a lot of features and it has quite a bit of power. The suspension is a bit better than this bike. And so I'm trying to get one for like an in-depth review and I'll report back to you when I'm able to do that. Let's talk about Honda CB500X. So I just got done testing the revised 22 Honda CB500X and I've also tested the 2021 CB500X. They updated the suspension and the brakes for this year. So long story short, the 500 is a small step above this in terms of power and torque. Uh, and highway capability. So it's got quite a bit more horsepower, quite a bit more torque. It's got the twin cylinder engine, it's smoother. It's a lot more uh, bottom end grunt. This bike, you have to rev it like so high as you saw in the video. The Honda, you can kind of lazily rev it and short shift and it's got enough torque to do that. This does not. So the Honda's in a slightly different category, but I think a lot of you are gonna be cross chopping it. For off-road, I would rather have this. This has a bit more suspension travel, it has more ground clearance, and it feels, the, the lighter weight is definitely noticeable. This is about uh, 50, 60 pounds lighter than that. That's quite a bit of weight. What about the Royal Enfield Himalayan? So the Himalayan has amazing styling, that amazing heritage. It does have pretty good suspension, long travel. It's got a 21 inch front wheel for going over obstacles, decent ground clearance. It's good at carrying luggage. It's, uh, it's a great motorcycle. It is a bit on the heavier side and it actually has quite a bit less horsepower than this. So if you're looking to go down the freeway, as we call it here in the US, at like, you know, 70, 75 miles per hour or like around 110 to 120 kilometers per hour, this is a little bit better. You have more horsepower. This is 34 horsepower versus about, I think, 25 horsepower on the Himalayan. So that's a big factor that you need to keep in mind. What about Honda CRF 300L Rally? So that bike is very, very high off the ground, very tall seat height, much longer suspension travel, although the suspension is extremely soft on that bike. Um, that bike is more of a big dual sport bike or a tall dual sport bike than it is an adventure bike. So it's more aimed at the off-road riding with that cool rally styling. Um, it's not gonna be as good, in my opinion, I know I'm gonna get flack for this, but in my opinion, this is probably better for beginners just because of the lower seat. And I feel like this is just, um, I don't know, a little bit easier to ride and to learn on than that Honda 300 Rally. Now, the standard 300L, that's a dual sport bike and that's a whole different category, but you could look at that as well. What about Kawasaki's Versus X300? Now, not many people know about that bike. I haven't been able to do a review on one, but I can tell you it has a very high revving uh, parallel twin engine, so it's probably gonna have a little less engine vibration. Uh, it has decent amount of horsepower, and the specs look kind of similar to this, so that's a bike you should take a look at. Final thoughts on BMW's G310 GS. Now, I've seen some chatter on the internet with people saying that they don't think the GS label should go on a bike with this kind of low end features, low end price point, lower end quality and things like that. Now, I completely disagree. I think that's a bit too much of elitism going on because all GS means is Galanda Strasse on and off road. And as we showed in this video, you can go on and off road. And this is gonna get a lot of the bigger GS owners upset, but keep in mind that I own a big GS, so I'm allowed to say this, this is so much better off-road than the big GSs. Why do you need 135 horsepower and 550 to 600 pounds, huge, giant, tall bike that all you do is tip over all day? I mean, most people do anyway. Uh, you get more experience and you get better. But what I'm trying to say is that this is what you should be learning on, not a 1250GS. Don't believe the marketing hype of you know this gigantic adventure bike. They look amazing parked in front of the coffee shop and they are very capable, I've made that point in my videos, but uh, you, you have to invest a ton of training, a ton of time learning how to ride a huge heavy bike like that off-road. And those are really best as more sport touring or touring bikes that have the off-road capability for the very experienced riders. But for the average off-road rider, someone getting into adventure riding or dual sport riding, this is amazing. It's so light and small, it's not intimidating, it's not high off the ground, 
And when you drop it or crash it, you're only dropping or crashing a $6,000 bike instead of a $25,000 bike. So I don't get why so many people buy the huge GSs or other huge adventure bikes to start their off-road journey. Get this, that's what this is made for. Now, I'm sorry, I know that was kind of a soapbox, so let me come down off the soapbox and the rant. That was an Ian's rant, by the way. Um, but I also wanna say that in terms of these final thoughts, even if you don't care about going off-road, this is still a very cool motorcycle that you should check out. I mean, the styling's really cool. It's affordable. BMW has a really good warranty. They have amazing financing programs that allow you to get in this bike for like, here in the US, dealers advertise these for like 90 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month. I mean, you know, I can't even fill my truck uh, with diesel for any less than $150 for a tank. So um, this thing is amazing at that price. So even if you don't care about off-road, if you want a commuter bike and all around easy to ride motorcycle uh, with the BMW nameplate, then this is something you should really check out. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me through this whole review. I hope you got some value out of it. Please support Big Rock Moto and there's ways to do that in the description below. Other than that, please ride safe and I'll see you out there.